going on guys? Pat here and in today's video we're going to be discussing the new wheel and tire setup on my Oldsmobile. We're going to be discussing the new setup, the old setup, what's different, why I changed, the pros and cons of this new setup, and if it's something you should consider doing on your Pro Touring muscle car. Alright, so I've been getting a lot of questions about the new wheel and tire setup that I've been running. I also got a lot of questions about the old wheel and tire setup I was running before this. So I figured I'd put together a video discussing the two setups, um, how exactly I went about specking them out, pros and cons, and you know, if it's something that's a good fit for you or you know what you should consider when you're putting together a wheel and tire setup for your pro touring car. Now, previously I was running Forgestar F14 wheels. I still have them, they're just gonna kind of be my street wheels now. Um, and there was an 18 by eight and a half inch front wheel, 18 by 10 inch rear wheel, and the tires were a 255, 35, 18 front, and a 305, 35, 18 rear. So pretty heavily staggered setup. Uh, cool for the street, but not really great for the track. The tires were Toyo uh, R888s, not the new R888Rs, they were the original versions. And those are a super sticky 100 treadwear R compound tire that's really meant for doing things like track days. They're not really meant for autocross or the street. They don't really get heat well when you're doing an autocross. They take longer to heat up, so you're not really gonna heat them up over the course of a couple runs. And they just completely wear down on the street because it's a 100 treadwear. And in fact, they're illegal for most of the autocross series that I wanted to run in anyways. Things like the search for the ultimate street car, the good guys autocross, and running in the KMT class and SCCA all require a minimum of a 200 treadwear tire, and that's a 100 treadwear. So is softer than what's allowed. Um, so I knew going into this year, since I wanted to compete with the car, that I was going to have to uh, change compounds. And I figured since I'm already doing all these other big changes to the car to get it exactly where I want it to be, I might as well just change the wheel and tire setup and get the exact setup that I wanted, which is that sort of holy grail setup in the Pro Touring world of a 315 squared. Um, that's still very much the benchmark. I know there's some people running 335 squared now, but that's always been the, uh, the wheel and tire size that people have kind of shot for for a competitive car. There are faster cars running smaller tires, but there's just something cool about running a 315 in the front, and I really wanted to shoot for that. A lot of the competitive cars that are the inspiration for this build run that setup, so I figure that's a good, uh, good benchmark to shoot for, uh, to have a good wheel and tire package. Happy to say I achieved that and uh, we're gonna go a little more into the specs and how I arrived at them later in the video. Uh, but to, to give a quick overview, uh, the brand is Rocket Racing. Originally I discussed doing a set of Forge Line uh, GA3Rs in my original video that I'd posted on this channel, kind of go uh, going over my winter plans for the car. And really the biggest issue was lead time on the Forge Lines. Um, now I was gonna order the rears because I pretty much knew exactly what spec I needed. I was gonna test for those on the front and make sure that they were gonna work and then order the fronts. And you're looking about a six week lead time on each order from Forge Line. At least that's what I was kind of getting as an estimate at the time when I was considering getting that. And so had I gone there, I still wouldn't have all the wheels and tires here and the season's already started. And granted my car's still not ready, but it would, you know, I'd still be waiting another four weeks probably and I'd miss a bunch of events that I want to go to. So I decided for this year at least, we'll go with a more available and a little more affordable wheel and tire setup, uh, verify everything, kind of use this as a proof of concept, make sure this spec works. And then once I'm sure that this is going to work perfectly, commit to the better setup uh, next year. So. I end up going with uh, Rocket Racing. These are their Attack wheels, which is the only wheel they make in their line of Pro Touring wheels. They run them on their Camaro and now on their Datsun that they just released. And uh, there's a, quite a few Pro Touring cars running these. And what's nice is that these are pre-stocked. They're in stock, pre-made in most of the sizes that you'd want for a Pro Touring, you know, track-oriented muscle car. So I ended up going with an 18 by 11 inch wheel, front and rear, with six inches of backspacing in the front and rear. And it's nice because they already had it in stock, so I simply had to order it. There was no weight. There's no custom making the wheel. They were, you know, off the shelf. Um, this finish is the Hyper Shot. So it's a sort of a dark gunmetal center with machined outer. It's kind of hard to see the gunmetal center at times. It almost looks like the whole thing's just machined. Um, ended up going with these because they were on sale, and I figured, you know, I'd change it up from the black wheels that were on the car. And worst case, if I don't like them, I can just get them powder coated, uh, you know, for not that much money locally uh, into a color that I would like but I do like them so far, so we're gonna run them as is, and uh, hopefully they'll stay nice and pretty uh, over the course of uh, their life being on the car. Now, tires are uh, BFG Rival S 1.5s, uh, front and rear, 315, 30, 18, front and rear. Uh, so I was able to do the true square setup, with the square setup being the same size wheel and tire front and rear, but also same backspacing, so you can usually rotate back to front. Um, 
I wanted to originally try out the Yokohama AO52s. That's kind of the hottest treadwear, uh, 200 treadwear tire that's out there right now. Um, it is the fastest on pace, uh, depending on how you can set your car up. They like a lot of camera and usually have a little heavier cars. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they just weren't available. They're an indefinite back order tire rack. Um, I don't know why uh, there's such a shortage of them at the moment, at least in the sizes that I was looking for, but uh, hopefully they can be available by the end of the year and I can switch out and uh, give them a shot. I also was thinking about trying out the Yokohama RT660s, their new offering, which a lot of people seem to like. Um, same thing, they were on back order, I think for like a month uh, when I had looked. Uh, these were in stock. These aren't the fastest 200 treadwear tires anymore. The Yokohamas are faster and uh, people go back and forth whether the 660 is faster. Um, but this is a, you know, it's a good contender. It's still a proven race winning tire at many pro touring events. So I figured it's a good starting point. Um, so I can get used to the car and learn from the car. Um, there's no way I'm gonna be able to drive this thing anywhere near what it's capable of at any point this year. It's gonna be very much a learning process. So I don't really think tires are gonna be a huge contributing factor. As long as I have a good tire on there to start with, that's all that really mattered uh, for me. All right, so let's discuss how the new setup compares to the old setup and why I switched to this setup from the old one. Now, currently I'm running an 18 by 11 inch wheel front and rear with six inches of back spacing and a 315 30 18 tire front and rear. Now on the old setup, I was running a 255 35 18 tire in the front on an 18 by eight and a half inch wheel. And I was running a 305 35 18 tire in the back on an 18 by 10 inch wheel. And really the front tire size is the, was the big reason that I changed this setup. Uh, this is a big heavy car, especially with that big block Oldsmobile in there. There's a lot of weight on the nose and a 255 tire in the front just isn't enough for this car in an autocross or track setting. Uh, you really need at least a 275 tire to be competitive. So since the 255 tire that was on there was really the biggest tire that 18 by eight, eight and a half inch wheel uh, could hold, I knew I was gonna have to change front wheels. And I figured if I'm gonna do that, I might as well just go all the way and do the exact setup that I wanted to do. So I ended up replacing all of them. So in the end, we gained 60 millimeters on the front, at least in nominal size, because tire sizes don't always accurately depict just how big they are. A 315 from two different brands might be slightly different sizes, so I'm gonna just kind of speak in nominal terms here. So in the front, we gained 60 millimeters. The wheel is two and a half inches wider than what was there. And in the rear, we gained 10 inches of width, at least in nominal terms, and the wheel is one inch wider than what was there. All right, so let's discuss some of the pros and cons of this setup. Now, the biggest pro here, and the main reason people will do a wider wheel and tire setup or a square setup is increased mechanical grip. Now, I'm just gonna talk a size for any given tire compound here. I'm not gonna talk about different compounds comparing to each other. So we'll just talk about 200 tread wear for the sake of this video, because that's the stickiest tire that you can run on this in most of the classes that aren't some like open unlimited class. Now, for any given 200 tread wear tire, the wire size is going to give you better performance. You're gonna have a higher uh, force of friction and you're also gonna have a higher contact patch, uh, which the two are directly related. So the higher uh, friction force comes from the bigger contact patch that you're gonna have against the ground from a wider tire. Now, when you have a higher friction force, you can do things like decelerate better, which means better braking. When you have a bigger wheel and tire in the back, uh, you have higher friction force there as well. You get better acceleration. And front and back, when you go bigger, you get higher radial acceleration, which means you're gonna have higher cornering speeds. And all of this uh, greatly impacts uh, a car that's built for handling. So that's really the biggest pro. You know, compared to the 255, 305 setup that was on here, this 315 setup is gonna give you better braking, better acceleration, and better cornering, which are all attributes that you really want when you're building a pro touring car, especially one that's going to see regular track use. Now, an added benefit of a square setup is that I can rotate wheels and tires front to back. I can just unbolt the rears, put them on the front, and then swap front to back etc etc which means I can extend tire life a little bit longer than if I couldn't rotate uh, obviously front tires and rear tires wear a little differently especially on a live axle car and that means that I can swap back and forth and uh, help them wear a little evenly across the car and uh, you know help extend tire life a little bit so getting into the cons uh, really the first big con here is you're going to be increasing unsprung mass for any given wheel the wider a wheel is the more material is needed to make it which means it's going to be heavier uh, similarly, with a given tire, uh, the wider the tire is, um, the more material is going to be required to make it, so it's going to be heavier. And you could even go as far as saying that the 
you know, additional air that you need to fill a big wheel and tire setup is going to, you know, uh, give added mass. Now the unsprung weight isn't ideal because as you increase that, it makes your suspension a little more lethargic. The more unsprung weight you have, the slower your suspension will be to react to things like bumps and compression. And you really don't want that on a track car, but in most people's opinions, which I tend to agree with, the added performance benefit of increased grip from a wider wheel and tire setup is worth the penalty in unsprung weight. So kind of negates it, but it is something to consider. Now the second con here is going to be increased running costs. Your consumable cost of tires is going to go through the roof when you go to wider wheels and tires. Uh, for example, this 315 3018 Rival S 1.5 is about 300 and I think $70 a tire. I can check on tire rack and I'll throw the price up so it's uh, current, but it's, uh, it's pretty astronomical and that's sort of middle of the road for 200 treadwear tires. The RT660 is a little cheaper and the Yokohamas are over $400 a tire. So it's definitely something to consider, especially if you're someone who burns through tires or replaces tires a lot, is that even if you go through a set of tires a year, it's still gonna be $1,000 to $1,600 uh, just to get tires on this thing. Now the last con and probably the biggest con that prevents a lot of people from doing this setup is clearancing issues and getting your wheel specs just right so that it'll actually fit. Um, you know, there's pretty much no application in the, the 70 to 72 muscle car uh, range from the GMA bodies or F bodies or really anything from the 64 to 72 GM range that an 18 by 11 and a 315 is just going to bolt on with no issues. Uh, the 70 to 72 cars are probably the best candidates for doing a setup like this because they have the large wheels from the factory. But even then, there's going to be some massaging required. There, I'm sure there's some people out there who've bolted this setup on and haven't had to do anything, but that's very few and far between. And that's really not the norm. You shouldn't go into this thinking you're not going to have to do any work to make it fit because honestly, that's just unrealistic. Uh, you know, best case, you might just have to massage things with a little body hammer and roll the fenders a little bit, but worst case, you might have to end up, you know, uh, mini tubbing the car and taking your front wheel wells out and, you know, rolling fenders to make them fit. It's, uh, it's really tight because you can't just, you know, especially if it's a car you're going to be tracking, you can't just bolt these wheels on and leave it tight. You need to have room for the tire to flex and move and, you know, your suspension to articulate. So, you know, you have to put a lot of planning and effort into making these fit and function well. All right, so we're here at the back side of the car to kind of go over um, my process for how I spec'd out uh, the wheels for back here and things you should consider when you're specking out wheels for your car um, on a live axle car on the rear wheel and tire. So really this starts with the old wheel and tire setup that I had, which was something I gotten off Craigslist. Uh, the rear wheel was 18 by 10 uh, with six inches of back spacing. So from that, I knew um, basically uh, the inside edge where it sat uh, on a six inch backspacing wheel. Uh, basically the space between the inside edge of the tire and the wheel well, well in this case it's the wheel well slash frame because they sit on top of each other. Um, so that was good information to have when I decided to spec out new wheels because I knew, okay, given that the inside edge of the tire is gonna sit here, I can play with uh, stuff on the outside edge of the car. Because um, I knew that we had put a lot of effort in the winter to giving good clearance on the inside edge of the wheel. So I knew at six inches of back spacing, we were going to have comfortable space on the inside edge up against the frame uh, to have room for the, for the tire uh, to articulate in the rear and shift side to side, which I'll get a little more into in a minute. So really my focus uh, was now on the outside edge of the car, do I have enough room to do a one inch wider wheel and uh, a 10 millimeters more of tire, which again, 10 millimeters nominal. So really the biggest thing to consider when you're over here is this outer trim ring uh, that sits on the outer edge of the car. So this is where the uh, factory trim ring mounted to, which you can see mine is still in there. Um, and that's really going to be your uh, point of contact uh, in kind of interference issue uh, on the outer edge of the car. A lot of people cut them out, some people roll them. Um, I think we're gonna be good leaving this one in. The worst case, we can always massage it, but uh, that is, you know, something to consider. On the inside edge, it's going to be your wheel well and frame that you're going to hit. And on the outer edge, it's going to be this trim ring here if you still have it on your car. Now, you don't want these to overlap. That's where you're going to run into big issues. You know, if there is overlap between this uh, ring and the tire, uh, if you want to lower your car, you can only go so much before it hits. And more importantly, under suspension compression, your tire is going to hit that. Um, and you can risk cutting into your tire, damaging your wheel if it goes down far enough, slicing open your tire. Um, so it's just a, a lot of bad things can happen if you don't get it dead on. And the same thing can happen on the inside edge, which I discussed previously. Uh, in one of my first videos that I put out that we'd actually scalped the inside of a tire and almost cut it open, um, hitting it on the inside edge of the wheel well. So 
really the biggest things to consider here are your uh, outer edges uh, of where the tire is going to sit. These things have plenty of height up into the wheel well, uh, unless you're going to run the car super low, which if you're setting up for track use and autocross use, you're probably not going to do. So really your biggest concern here is going to be the side to side and getting that back spacing just right. Um, obviously they sell the wheel uh, back spacing tools, which I highly recommend. Um, you know, I wouldn't ever just take a guess. You know, I already had a good idea based off my old wheel, but had I not had that wheel, which was, you know, just one inch narrower and a tire that was, you know, almost the same as what was going on here, um, you know, definitely be something to, uh, to look into and probably something I would have gotten. Now, another thing to consider when you're considering clearances and space here is going to be uh, how the suspension works on the back side of the car. Now, first we'll start with deflection side to side. When you take a corner, uh, the polyurethane bushings are going to deflect side to side and push, which is going to allow the rear end to move side to side. Now, obviously, this isn't much of a concern if you have a pan hard bar or Watts link, but most A body cars don't, including this one, at least not yet. So you're going to have that movement there. So if you just have, you know, barely any space between the wheel and the wheel well, or the tire and the wheel well rather, uh, you know, there's a chance that when you're cornering hard, that wheel well can come up and slice it. Um, which, you know, something to look out for. That's something that caught us out before because not only is the rear wheel wall, uh, you know, going to be close when the differential moves, but also the tire moves on the wheel, uh, which uh, not a lot of people consider. You know, there's certain tires that do it more than others, like the Rival S's flex a lot, so do like our triple eights. Um, you know, all tires do it, and it's something you have to account for when you're doing it. It's just a matter of how much. Now, what I mean by that is, say this car is going to, you know, taking a hard right turn. We're back here on the, the back end of the driver's side, so if you're taking a, a right turn hard, like an autocross or something, then the, this side of the body, the driver's side, is going to push down as you go around that turn. So this wheel well lip here is going to come down and come near this tire. And what's interesting that happens is when the car is pushing out, because the force is coming this way when you're taking a right turn on the driver's side, it's pushing the wheel out. So in theory, the tire is moving in because the tire, well, really the tire is staying stationary. It's just pushing out uh, within the tire. So you're actually going to get a little additional clearance on this edge and it's going to push in towards the wheel well. So that's where, you know, between the rear end shifting and the tire shifting, you know, it's really important to have good clearance on that inside edge. Um, when it's on the passenger side, the tire will be pushing out towards the outside edge of the car on that same right hand turn, but the body's rolling up. So it's going to kind of lift up and off that tire. So you don't have to worry about clearance over there as much. So these are just things to consider back here. Like I said, backspacing is key. That's really going to be key front and rear. You know, if you are dead set on doing 18 by 11 uh, with a 315-30, then, you know, your overall diameters and specs of the tire are kind of constrained. Obviously, different 315s, like I said, are going to, you know, be slightly different heights or slightly different widths. But for the most part, they're in the same ballpark. So, um, you know, you just have to really dial it in with the backspacing if you want to get this going on the back of the car. Now, these... Wheel wells back here are, for the most part, factory. We didn't mini tub this car. Obviously, there's kits out there that you know kind of eliminate all this, um, but not everybody wants to go through the hassle of mini tubbing a car. Uh, and you don't have to to run a 315. If you want to get into something like a 335, then you know you're probably going to have to start looking into that. But uh, for the sake of running a 315, you know if you're if you're smart about it, uh, you know you can most of the time make it work within the factory wheel. Obviously there's gonna be some you know, strange cases where it's not gonna work, but uh, with a little massaging, it can definitely work, uh, work back here. So. All right, so we're here at the front of the car and I just wanted to kind of go over uh, what is needed to you know, account for specking out a wheel on the front of the car. It's very similar to the back, but there are a few factors that are different when uh, you know, deciding on a wheel spec for the front of the car. So I just kind of wanted to go over that. Now my process for specking out the front wheels on this car was the exact same as it started on the back, which was I used the old wheel and tire setup off the back of the car uh, to kind of mock up around the car. Because although it was an 18 by 10 inch wheel with a 305, 35, 18 tire, the actual overall width of that tire was very similar to what this was. And it was actually a little taller, so it was going to take up more space than this does. Uh, so it's going to be a good ballpark uh, to kind of put me where I needed to be. So I bolted that uh, old setup on the front of the car uh, probably two years ago, and I took a bunch of pictures and kind of made notes of how it fit. And uh, that put me in a pretty good spot because on the front end of the car, if you run, uh, you know, too much back spacing, then you're going to lose some of your steering radius because you're going to hit the sway bar and you're going to be very limited on your steering. But if you run too little back space, you're going to risk hitting the, the outer edge of the fender, especially under, you know, turning. That's going to, you know, be a big issue. So you want to kind of nail that back spacing just like you want to do in the rear. That's really the key to getting a, a wide wheel and tire setup is getting that back spacing just right. Now, 
the shifting side to side you don't have to worry about in the front at least in the suspension itself because unlike the live axle back there this suspension isn't going to push in and out like that it's not going to deflect on the bushings uh, like it does in the rear but the tire is still going to roll just like it does in the rear you know it's going to have the same behavior um, in the sense that if you were to take that same right hand turn that i discussed in my previous example uh, the body would roll which i can kind of push on the wheel to simulate you'd see it kind of push down the body would roll down over the tire and the tire would be uh, going in towards the inside of the frame so you still have to you know have those considerations uh, inside to out but a nice thing that you have on the front suspension that you don't have the rear is camber unless you're running like a camber floater or something in the rear um, but assuming you don't have that uh, you have camera in the front, and that's uh, a tool that will help you get fitment. Now, you shouldn't just throw a bunch of negative camera in a car just to get a wheel and tire to fit, but if you are running an aggressive track alignment, say, you know, negative two, negative two and a half degrees on one of these cars, um, that will aid in clearance, and it will give you a little better clearance if you were just going to run straight up at zero or, you know, negative one or anything. And, uh, you know, it's going to help give you clearance on this outer edge where it meets the fender, which is something to consider. And obviously, as the suspension compresses, it gains negative camber, uh, which is only going to give you additional clearance on this outer edge, but you're going to also be bringing it closer to the inside edge um, on the inner edge or the edge of the wheel that's near the engine. So you do have to be very careful with, uh, you know, the outer edge on the fenders. That's why some people that run uh, 315s in the front don't run wheel wells because this becomes, you know, uh, a potential clearance issue uh, as suspensions compress and turn and things like that. Because obviously you don't have to worry about uh, wheels turning on the rear wheel wells, but you do have to worry about the front. Um, so you just have to be careful with that. But, you know, it's, it's nothing too crazy. There are some cars that run it, like namely the uh, ABC Performance Chevelle runs a 315 square setup with uh, wheel wells in the front. So it can be done if you're, uh, if you're careful about, you know, how you spec everything out. But it's, uh, it's really nothing too crazy. A lot of it, like I said, just like with the back, is going to be uh, all in the back spacing. Um, and yeah, again, have the added factor of, you know, considering steering on the front end and camber. But, uh, you know, it's, a, it's nothing too impossible to have to, uh, to work around and figure out. All right, so just kind of wanted to have this section be uh, my sort of final thoughts and closing out the video. So with this video, I really just wanted to discuss the new wheel and tire setup on the car, um, kind of go over my process behind specking out the wheels and kind of show you what's involved in doing a wheel and tire setup like this. Because even if you are buying an off the shelf wheel like I did, there is still a lot of effort that goes into measuring and make sure everything's going to work on the car uh, once you put it on. Uh, so when you drive it hard, you're, you're not going to have any unexpected failures or issues. Now. As far as applications for this setup, you know, if you're going to have a car that's going to be on the street 90% of the time, is it worth the hassle? Probably not, to be honest. But if you think it's cool, you know, absolutely go for it. Uh, just because it is a setup that's more geared towards track-oriented cars doesn't mean you can't put it on a street car if you, you know, you don't think it's cool. It's, it is cool to see. Um, so, you know, if it's something you really want to have on your car or track car or not, you know, go for it. Uh, just have your due diligence and, uh, you know, be careful with your measurements. Just because this 18 by 11 inch wheel with six inches of backspacing fits my car doesn't mean it's going to your car you know you could have a 1970 cutlass same as mine built the same day in the same plant and you know these wheels might not fit your car there's such variation in these classic cars that you always need to have your due diligence you know double check your measurements and you know really make sure the wheels fit your specific application your brakes your suspension your everything just because you read it on the forum or see in this video doesn't mean it's going to work for you so you know can't stress that enough you know spend the money on a good wheel measurement tool you know check all your clearances make sure everything's good because this could very quickly turn into a very expensive mistake so i hope you guys enjoyed the video if you have any comments or questions or anything feel free to comment below if you like the video feel free to leave a like and please subscribe for more i'll see you guys in the next one